Well, good evening. My name is Nicholas Byrne, and as your Animus president, I would like to welcome you to our this evening's annual uh, Animus virtual symposium, which is part of our medical procedure ed education series. So before I get started, I'd like to remind you of our upcoming meeting. We have the ANMS clinical meeting on July 26th to the 28th in 2024 in Baltimore, Maryland, and then the FMN meeting in November 6th through the 8th in Thailand, uh, Bangkok. So this evening's uh, symposium is entitled Pearls of Wisdom, GI Dietitian Billing Strategy. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Jason Baker. So Dr. Baker is the Director of Clinical Programs in Annex Academy. He is internationally recognized expert in motility disorders. Over the last two decades, he's been in many key leadership roles, um, including the Associate Director of the GI Physiology Laboratory at University of Michigan, Clinical Research Director at Atrium Health, and Director of Clinical Programs in Annex Robotica Academy for Annex Robotica. His research portfolio has included partnering with diverse investigators, uh, interdisciplinary teams, and his projects range from clinically centric to pharmacologic pathology and biomedical technology. He is currently the executive director and member of the Lower Gastrointestinal in Internal Consortium. So with that, I'd like to turn over the program this evening to Dr. Jason Baker. Dr. Baker, we'll hand it off to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Byrne, for the kind introduction. Um, we are very blessed tonight to have a very, um, I think, it's going to be a very thought-provoking and very important um, uh, Pearls of Wisdom presentation um, that's going to help a lot of practices um, where they're at and, and, and build upon what they have or, or maybe even develop one moving forward. Um, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to have a few housekeeping uh, items. Is that uh, for all the questions tonight, if you could put them in the Q&A um, app on the bottom of the screen, and I will... Um, work with Nancy to answer them after the presentation along the way. And then, um, and we'll try to get through as many as possible um, um, as the time permits. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. It's uh, Nancy Jaffe. It, she is the lead dietitian for the UCLA Vache and Tamar Manukian Division of D Digestive Diseases. Nancy was recruited in 2012 to help uh, develop a comprehensive GI nutrition program to enhance care for patients with specific nutritional issues and to provide ongoing nutritional education to UCLA GI fellows, gastroenterologists, and other healthcare professionals. The GI nutrition program is now an integral part of the division's integrative uh, digestive health and wellness program. Nancy spearheaded an effort to formalize a GI-specific dietitian group housed jointly under the American Gastroenterological Association and Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which became official in 2020. Nancy graduated from California State University, Los Angeles, where she earned her Master's of Science in Nutrition. She completed her dietetic internship at Cedar sinai Medical Center at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she was mentored by Dr. Lin Chang. She comes highly recommended uh, throughout the process from Kate Scarletta, Dr. Lin Chang, Dr. Shea, William Shea from Michigan. So we're very blessed to have her. Um, Nancy, we're really looking forward to this and um, we're very blessed to have you. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's really wonderful to be here with everyone today. So let me get back to the top of my slides, whoops, and share my screen. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen well. So first of all, thank you to ANMS for inviting me to speak. It really is an honor to be invited to the Pearls of Wisdom series. Um, as they mentioned, um, my name is Nancy Jaffe. I work at UCLA, and I'm hoping to talk with you about GI dietitian billing strategies. So I'm going to start by admitting that this is a very difficult topic, and this was definitely one of the harder lectures that I've had to prepare. Um, and the main reason is there's a lot of misinformation out there. So there's 
there's a lot of misinformation. It can be very confusing um, and it's not always straightforward. And for that reason, um, I'm hoping that we can go through this together and that by the end of this lecture, you'll leave with um, a lot of good new information um, and maybe even some questions, which is okay, but that um, Overall, you will see the necessity of having a dietitian as part of the integrative GI practice and that it is doable, that it is possible to bring a dietitian into the practice. So the overview for um, our lecture tonight is we're gonna go over facts and myths on dietitians and billing. And then we're gonna take each one of the myths and we're gonna debunk them one at a time, or at least we're gonna expand on them, we're gonna understand them, and we're gonna break them down so that they're no longer problems, they're no longer issues that we have to deal with. And then hopefully by the end, um, we'll get into how you can start to bring a dietitian into your practice and ways to make that happen. So let's start with some facts. So the first fact I hope everyone knows is that GI needs dietitians, not just the doctors, but really the whole GI team, um, the whole multidisciplinary team requires dietitians. And this was a great study that was done um, by my colleague Kate Scarlotta and the University of Michigan team where they surveyed almost 280 doctors to find out basically what were some of the benefits and obstacles to working with a dietitian and how easy was it to kind of get a dietitian on the team. So 77% of these doctors said that they spent less than 10 minutes talking about nutrition with their GI patients. 46% said sometimes, rarely, or never do they provide information on meal planning, label reading, and grocery shopping, which if you've ever worked with a dietitian or seen a dietitian counseling a patient, these are fundamental tools that we use to make the process practical of giving diet, nutrition, intervention, and advice. 91% strongly agreed or agreed that having access to a GI dietitian would really be helpful in caring for their patients, especially their IBS patients. But unfortunately, 42% lacked access to a local GI dietitian. So we know that doctors not only need a dietitian, the team needs a dietitian, but it's not always easy for them to find the dietitian they're looking for. So we're going to try and make that a lot easier after this lecture, hopefully. The other thing is we know that patients want nutrition advice, right? So this was another study that was done in 2022 of 185 IBS patients, where they were looking at patient choices for their care. So if patients were given the option of psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, and um, nutrition, what would they choose? And 48%, the overwhelming majority, chose that they would want dietary intervention as their preferred option. So our patients are wanting nutrition advice when it comes to GI. So it's really important that we have experts available because as we know, GI patients are very complex um, and diet is very complex. And so it requires an expert in the field to be able to talk knowledgeably and in a way that's practical and doable for our patients to actually follow and execute. These patients deserve proper education and a per personalized approach. And this is really what a GI dietitian is an expert at. Also, adding a dietitian into your team does not have to be complicated. And when I talk with doctors about um, their thoughts on why they don't have a dietitian as part of their practice, um, often what I hear are some of these. This is what kind of keeps, these are some of the myths about dietitians and billing. Um, doctors will worry that having a dietitian is not a good investment or that they've heard insurance does not cover for dietitians and that they're not able to bring in any money. These are things that maybe you've thought yourself or you've heard other providers say. So I want to spend the next several slides taking each one of these myths one at a time and addressing them so that we can hopefully illuminate ourselves on the process of billing for dietitians. So let's start with number one, which is that having a dietitian is not a good investment. All right. So when we think about investments, things we're investing in our company to make our company work better, we always often start by thinking about what are some of the low hanging fruit? What are things that we can add that don't cost a lot, but bring a lot of return for that investment? And I don't love saying this, but dietitians are cheap. We're one of those low hanging fruits. So the cost of having a dietitian is pretty low. So this is the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics from May of 2022, looking at dietitians across the country and what their annual salary is. And you can see that the median is about $66,000. So I come from California, which is 
you know, a pretty progressive state and also a, a bit of a wealthy state. So I was curious if these numbers were true for dietitians working in California. So when I looked at the average dietitian salary for a dietitian in California, and I was actually able to get statistics from September 2023, so just a month and a half ago, the salary was 76000 per year. So not so much better than what we're seeing as the median for across the nation. So having the cost benefit of a dietitian, we see that a dietitian really doesn't cost a lot, but they can bring a lot of value. So they could be considered a very good investment for your practice. So for instance, we're going to talk about the monetary value that uh, dietitians can bring in, but we know that dietitians bring in a whole lot more than just money. So the benefits that dietitians can offer to a practice include less physician and advanced medical provider follow-ups. So we've seen this at UCLA that when a doctor sees a patient. Nutrition advice is what the patient wants to do or believe to be the next right step. They send them over to my team and we'll often do the follow-up for the next several months. And we save the doctor on those return visits so that they can keep doing procedures and um, new patients, which is usually where a lot of the money is generated. Also, it means that we can save physicians on phone calls and emails, especially when it concerns things like diet and supplements. So now that the doctor has a member of the team who can speak specifically to the patient's questions about diet and supplements, they no longer have to spend time in a session or on a phone call or in an email talking to or answering those types of questions or giving that type of advice. They can say, well, we've got a great member of the team. We've got a registered GI expert dietitian who can answer those questions. Let's pass you to them. Let's make sure that they can answer those appropriately for you. Also, we saw in just a couple of slides previously that patients want nutrition advice. So we're actually adding a lot of value to our patient-centered care model by giving them the opportunity to meet with a GI expert dietitian. And I'm not going to go too deep into um, these um, PC um, MHs or patient-centered medical homes, but anyone who's following medicine and the trajectory that medicine is taking, I think we're finding that these patient-centered medical homes are really the future of where at least primary care is going, and I think we're going to find a lot of specialty practices are also heading this way. It's not only because they provide better care coordination and their evidence-based care, but we really need to be reforming the healthcare system so that it is more accessible, economical, safe, efficient, and effective for our patients, which we all know we're struggling in these areas right now. Um, and what's great is, you know, one of the big um, headaches for people with bringing a dietitian into the practice is they worry that there's not going to be sufficient reimbursements. And I'm going to talk about insurance next. Um, but this is actually what is being looked at in these patient-centered medical homes. Um, there's actually a group, or I guess it's technically a project um, called the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus that's been going on for about the past four years. It's a five-year project that is launched in 14 different regions across the United States, where they're actually looking at innovative payment models that would allow these multidisciplinary teams to be created because they've learned that that is what is needed as a multidisciplinary team, which includes a dietitian as part of the practices. So that really leads us into our next topic, which is the myth of insurance, right? So I hear this all the time that, oh, well, dietitians are just not covered by insurance. And for that reason, there's no money to be made and they're not a good investment. And all of those other myths kind of fall from this. So dietitians absolutely are covered by insurance. So it's just understanding how the insurance works around dietitians. So dietitians bill under medical nutrition therapy codes or medical nutrition therapy CPTs. Our codes are 97802, 803, and 804. And basically these codes allow us to do face-to-face -face sessions, which does include telehealth. So these codes do work for telehealth as well as in-person sessions. And dietitians bill at 15-minute increments. So most dietitians are going to do about four to six increments or four to six units um, for an initial session, and they'd use that 97802 code. For follow-ups, most dietitians are doing between two and four um, units, and that's that nine. 97803 code. And I know that this is really a big push at UCLA is to do more group sessions. Not only do group sessions allow for better access 
for our patients because we can see four, six, 12 patients at a time. Um, but it also allows for more availability for the dietitian to see follow-ups. Um, and it also means that we're getting the initial session out of the way. We're giving that basic information to our GERD patients or maybe people who are going to start the low FODMAP diet or newly diagnosed celiac patients. And then they can do follow-ups as they've kind of let that information settle and they're now ready to take it to that next step. Um, also at UCLA, we have something called pseudocodes. And this is something that I think is really important, especially if you're at um, an academic setting. Pseudocodes allow for self-pay patients. So if an insurance isn't going to cover for a nutrition session, my dietitians can drop the code that is the regular MNT code with three zeros attached to the end. And this automatically tells our billing department, don't bill insurance. Instead, give them the fee for service rate of $200 for a new visit and $100 for a return. And it makes it very easy for our patients to navigate the system. Um, because if insurance is going to cover, we can still see them and we can still see them at a very very reasonable price. So what about getting a little bit deeper into the different types of insurance? So when we think about PPO insurance, this is where it's not quite so straightforward, right? So insurance coverage is really dependent on a lot of things, which includes the state the insurance is from, the insurance provider, as well as the individual plan that the patient has with that provider, as well as their diagnosis. So I've been at UCLA 12 years, and I'll give you a little bit of my history towards the end of this presentation. Um, and in the beginning, we were really trying to understand, okay, what providers are more likely to cover for dietitians? Okay, what plans with those providers are more likely to cover? What diagnoses? And what we learned is it was a fool's errand to go about it that way, because we could have two patients with the same provider and seemingly the same plan and the same diagnosis and one would get covered and one wouldn't. So unfortunately, in order to check if a PPO is going to cover, which I can tell you a lot of them do. So a lot of them do cover for nutrition services and there's usually just a copay that the patient has to do. But we want to make sure we're checking insurance ahead of the session so the patient isn't surprised and hit with a big bill at the end of the session, right? So what we do at UCLA is we have um, a team that actually will call ahead of time and see if insurance is covered. The other thing we can do is we've got a beautiful flyer that we hand out that gives all of the insurance information and what patients can do to check insurance themselves. So it includes things like Look at the telephone number on the back of the insurance card, have the CPT or MNT codes available, have the tax ID, all of that is on the flyer that we give to the patient. Tell it to your insurance company and they'll be able to tell you how many sessions you're covered for, or if you're not covered, or if there's going to be a copay. And that way the patient knows ahead of time what's going to work for them. In terms of HMO, this is very easy. We just need the referring physician to request authorization. Once we get that author oops, authorization letter that has an expiration date and the number of visits they're allowed to see the dietitian, we can see them, right? So I have a lot of patients who are given um, six sessions over a year. And so we will spread those out over the year to make sure that they've got coverage as they need it. And of course, if I need to see them more frequently in the beginning and we move through those visits quickly, we can always ask for another authorization to get them in. So where I think the big confusion comes from is Medicare and Medicaid. So when people say that GI dietitians are not covered by insurance, what they are talking about is Medicare. So this is a true statement when it comes to Medicare and really to Medicare only. So visits with a GI dietitian will never be covered, at least not at this point in time, not even by Part B or secondary. The reason being that the only diagnoses that are covered by Medicare currently are diabetes, kidney disease, and sometimes obesity. So this means a lot of huge diagnoses, even outside of GI, cancer, hypertension, malnutrition, eating disorders, none of those are gonna be covered by Medicare, okay? So what we do at UCLA is we have patients sign what's called an advanced beneficiary notice or an ABN, which basically lets them know you have Medicare, Medicare doesn't cover, this is what Medicare will cover. So unfortunately it does not fit within the reason you're coming to see the GI dietitian and that we recommend that you do our fee for service rates, right? If a patient says, no, my insurance is good, they'll be covered and they choose even with signing the ABN, 
to go and have insurance billed, whatever cost is determined by the insurance company is what they'll be 100% responsible for. And it can be as much as $625. So I encourage my patients to sign that ABN, which they have to in order to see one of our dietitians, pay the self pay or fee for service rate, and then get an invoice from our billing um, center that they can then submit for reimbursement. And if it happens to cover amazing, but it's going to get denied, but at least they tried, but they're only hit with that $200 or $100 charge. So for anyone who is interested in advocacy or lobbying, um, I wanted to put out there that in um, 2021, there was an act called the Medical Nutrition Therapy Act. And basically the goal of this act was to allow more patients access to dietitians using their Part B insurance. Okay, and this would cover not only some of the things I mentioned, obesity, um, hypertension, dyslipidemia, malnutrition, but it would cover all GI conditions, celiac disease, IBD, IBS. So um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, and then because of everything that's happening in Congress right now, it's been at a bit of a standstill, but it is still breathing. It is still an act that we are hoping to get passed at some point, And it could make a huge shift to the number of patients that are able to get covered for their dietitian visits. All right, so what about Medicaid? So Medicaid, as most of us know, is the nation's largest health care plan. It covers one in five Americans. And it's, again, not as straightforward as we would like it to be because individual states determine who is eligible and what it covers them for, right? The federal government has chosen to not say that all medical nutrition therapy needs to be provided or covered. But about half of the states have elected to have some benefits for nutrition counseling. So what we've seen in California, because we are one of the states that has some form of coverage for MNT with Medicaid, is that either the cost will be completely covered by the Medicaid plan that they have, or it's offset by the university, which means the university would have to eat the cost, right? Which means that if you're in private practice, getting coverage for Medicaid is very, very difficult. And these patients are often thought of the same way we think of our Medicare patients. So we would treat them similarly with giving them the information about self-pay and um, non-coverage. All right. So that brings me into the fact that there's differences, not just based on insurance, but what work setting we're talking about. Right. So I'm I, again, have been at UCLA for um, over 12 years now, amazingly. Um, and I also have a private practice of my own. So I've been able to see some of the distinctions between private practice and academics um, in terms of getting coverage. So in the university setting, very lucky. We've got a patient call center um, that is able to schedule our patients. We've got a financial clearance unit that will call the insurance companies, talk through what the patient's diagnosis is, and let us know if they're going to be covered, have a copay, or not be covered. And then within each clinic that houses a dietitian, there's a, a staff member called a patient service representative, and their entire job is to call the patient confirm they're coming to their appointment and let them know of the covered situation so that they can decide if they wanna do self-pay, go through insurance, et cetera. Also at the academic facility, dietitians can bill for any direct patient care. So this includes telephone encounters, telemedicine or health encounters and in-person encounters. In community or private practice, dietitians can either have their own private practice and act as consultants or referral banks for the doctor, or they may be brought into the doctor's practice, right? And this can be done in many different ways. I've seen dietitians who simply rented space from the doctor and they basically were paying rent for the space, but then whatever money they made, they made because they could have people from the doctor or they could have their own patients come to their office, right? Which just happens to be in this GI clinic. Another more popular way is for the GI doctor to actually bring them in as staff and pay them a salary. And then any money that's made from the dietitian visits goes to the practice itself, right? Um, and we're about to go into licensure. But what we've learned is that in um, licensure states, insurance coverage is, seems to be a little bit easier, whereas in non-licensure state, it's very common for private practice dietitians to choose fee-for-service models. And as um, someone in California, with, which is a non-licensure state, that is the approach that we've chosen to go with. So what is this licensure thing that I'm talking about? 
So dietitians are certified healthcare providers. We have to go through certain types of training, right? So we spend a couple thousand hours being trained. We have to go through certain types of schooling. We have to have our master's degree in nutrition or in public health, and we have to pass a national exam. But licensure is determined state by state. So what you see here is our, our beautiful United States with all the pretty colors. And let's go through what each of these colors has to say for itself. So you can take a look and see where your state is on the map and what color it is. And that way you'll know what I'm talking about when I get to um, the different color that your state happens to be. So for all of the red states you see on the map, they have what we call practice exclusivity, which is basically another way of saying they are licensured states states. So these are states that not only require licensure for a dietitian to provide medical nutrition therapy and bill using those codes, but to even practice as a dietitian. So they've also got what we call title protection, which means someone who goes and takes a one day class or a one week seminar and is calling themselves a nutritionist cannot practice medical nutrition therapy. Okay. And so for instance, if we look at one of our red states, such as New Mexico, Patients within a red state will basically want to be working with a dietitian within that same state, right? And same dietitians within that state can only work with patients within that state. In terms of our green states, um, this is where it's almost like a free for all. So there's not only no licensure, but there's no title protection, okay? In yellow states, such as California, they protect our title. So no one can practice as a dietitian unless they are a dietitian, um, but there is no licensure rules, which is why in California, there's lots of people who are nutritionists and are practicing nutrition, though they may have really high degrees or they may not. So it's really hard to know what's going on there. And then gray states are fascinating because they are kind of abstaining from choosing any direction. Um, they basically are not formally weighing in on licensure or title, um, but they can practice medical nutrition therapy. And there's also something called provider delivered care management that's available in these gray states where they're seeming to get really good reimbursement rates. I heard from my Michigan colleagues as high as 95% reimbursement, which is pretty fantastic. So I also just wanted to put out there that if you come from a licensure state, um, getting licensure across state lines right now can be really tough, but it's going to be made much simpler um, in the next upcoming months. Um, so if you happen to live in a town that's on the border of two different states and you want your dietitian to be able to practice with patients coming across the state, this will be made much easier in the near future. So as I'm wrapping up, I want to go into our last myth, which is that dietitians aren't able to make money. And I really want to talk about it by kind of giving you a little bit of an introduction to my story. So I was very lucky. I was trained at UCLA um, and I became a dietitian in 2012. Um, and I'm very lucky that they wanted to keep me because it's been an amazing place to work. In 2017, once we figured out billing and really got my, I'm sorry, it's just moving on its own. Um, once we figured out the billing situation, I was able to hire my next dietitian in 2017. And you'll see we had pretty rapid expansion after that point. So in 2019, we got our third dietitian. 2021, we got our fourth. In 2022, we were so busy during the pandemic, we got our um, fifth and sixth. And then we just got um, our seventh as of this year. And so not only are we bringing more access and more availability to patients, but we're also bringing more expertise. So you can see that we all specialize in GI, but we all sub-specialize in other conditions. And we're also spread out across the Southland so that we have better access for our patients. So not only are we giving good hopefully dietitian advice, nutrition advice, but we're also bringing other accomplishments, right? So we're creating multidisciplinary teams across the health system, including our Nutrition for Safer Surgeries perioperative program. We all participate in research. I was lucky enough, I believe I had five papers published last, last year, so we're helping to move forward um, what dietitians do in terms of research. And we also act as um, speakers at different conferences, as well as training the new GI fellows, which is really a wonderful thing. I have to say the best compliment I ever got was from a GI fellow who said, before I knew what a GI dietitian was, was, I would have said I didn't need one. And now that I've worked with one, I can't imagine having a practice without one. So in terms of our GI nutrition program, um, on average, it takes somewhere between one and three years for a dietitian to bring in a profit. And I want to 
Uh, the caveat to that is at UCLA, there's a lot of legwork that has to be done to get a dietitian up and running, right? They have to go through six months of credentialing and six months of training, and we have to get their patient schedule up and get their patient load going. And there's also really high overhead costs, um, about 40%, which is not going to be the same in private and community and at other hospital settings. And most dietitians are covering their cost. I'm a supervisor, so supervisors and managers never cover their cost, but for the most part we do. But the other thing we do is we bring in donor funds. So I've had the honor and privilege of working with a lot of our VIP donors, um, not just within my program and the division, but at the university level um, and to help bring in, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to help support the great work that we're doing here. Also, by having as big a team as we have, again, we're allowing the physicians to do more procedures and see more new patients, which means they are going to get to bring in more money. They get more RVUs. And um, we also, you know, we're the largest GI program in the country. So that's really exciting. And then we will be speaking at DDW next year, which is great. All right. So I know I'm at the end of my time. So really quick, a checklist for getting a dietitian into your practice. If you're not sure where to start, maybe start by looking at the Digit or Dietitians in Gluten and Gastrointestinal Disorders website. You can find an expert dietitian there. All of SGI dietitians are members. The AGA also will be creating a directory that is up and running, but it's not fully in place yet. So you can see a couple dozen dietitians are on there, and we're currently vetting dietitians to make sure that anyone who's added to that directory is really skilled and knows what they're doing. Also, if there isn't anyone locally, consider telehealth options as long as you understand licensure rules. Um, come up with reasonable self-pay rates that meet industry standards. If possible, have an office staff who's able to contact insurance companies for PPO. And if not, make sure that you're making it easy for your patients to be able to do that by giving them like a flyer or a one pager. No licensure rules in your state. And then finally, you know, the next step is really to have dietitians managing other dietitians. So once you get one dietitian in, encourage them to help build a team. Because we know that when programs are built with a dietitian who's doing that same work in the lead, they grow faster right? Whereas if we have um, a dietitian from another division, or we've got an HR person or a doctor in charge of these programs, they can become quite static and not grow in the same way that we would want them to. So I guess the challenge is to be a champion and, and an advocate for your dietitians. I can't thank the doctors and my chief at UCLA enough. Without their support, there would be no program. There would be no Nancy as a dietitian speaking to you today. Um, so thank you for being excited about the work that we do. I hope you'll come to DDW in 2024 and come to our incorporating a G expert dietitian into your GI practice lecture. It'll be an hour and a half. There will be all sorts of different types of practices on display and how they made that model work. So you'll get to learn a whole lot more than I was able to give you today. We have um, resources available that will be sent to you, I believe, emailed after the lecture. And then please feel free to reach out to me. We're going to answer questions now, but if there's anything um, that you want to message me separately or any questions you think about after the lecture, these are my email addresses. Feel free Free to use them. I'm here to be a resource. So thank you. That was fan. That was fantastic, Nancy. That was really, really fantastic. I um, wrote a, a copious amount of notes of stuff I didn't. I didn't know along the way. Even uh, helping develop a few of these programs. Thank you very much. We got a. We have some time for Q and A. And um, we got several questions in the box. So uh, since um, I'll just I'll just I'll I'll, I'll uh, state them to you, and you just provide some answers, and I may provide a little bit of feedback in there if needed. But um, the do. first one comes yeah. from Brooke Irwin. Um, do your non-Medicare patients also sign a billing responsibility form prior to the appointment? So only if they have been shown that their insurance will not cover, we do have a self-pay form. Um, so if a patient has a PPO insurance and it's a non-covered benefit, we do ask that they sign that self-pay form ahead of time. Yes. Okay. And this is probably a little follow-up to this. This is from also Brooke Irwin. Um, um, what guidance or how do you collect the ABNs for virtual visits? It's a great question. And it was definitely 
a really painful process to figure out at the beginning of the pandemic when we went completely virtual. Um, but we've actually been able to figure out ways to electronically have it attached to when an appointment is set up within our medical record system. So of course, if you don't have that already set up, it means that there needs to be a front desk person who, as soon as the appointment is set up, that they ought to, you know, once insurance is checked, they're sending that form to them. But the easier approach, of course, is if it can be attached to the visit. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Dr. Parkman at Temple. Um, how for how for GI physicians to get local GI nutritionists to help them? Is there a way to find them? How do you reach out to them to build a relationship with the nutritionist outside an academic program? Great question. And this is where I think Digid can be a helpful resource. So any GI dietitian who is dedicated to GI nutrition is going to be a part of Digid. Um, and so that's that dietitians in gluten and gastrointestinal diseases. So that's one way is that you can always message us there and we can send out, we've got a listserv to all 300 members um, and we can find out who is local to you. Um, if there isn't someone local, then we can at least find out who's able to do telemedicine or telehealth in your state so that you then will have access to at least virtual options if you don't have options that are in person. Excellent. Um, this comes from Nicole Misner. Um, can you speak more about uh, setting up group classes? Yeah, and this is actually something I'm relatively new to as well. Um, so what's great is within our medical record, we've been able to do like a pseudo Zoom style meeting. Um, and what they're doing is they're now using that to do group classes. Um, so I have to admit, I have not done my first group class yet. They are starting them in diabetes and they've gone really, really well. I have my meeting with the group class coordinator in January, so I'll have a lot more information at that point in time. But my understanding is that they will be able to register the same way that they sign up for an appointment and there will be a cap on the number of patients that can be seen. I think in um, for our 97804 code, the max is 24 patients, I believe. So that would probably be the max in the class that we would be able to do. And then there's a couple of key things that have to be done. Um, like there's a couple of key areas that have to be filled out for insurance to cover it, but it would be done the same way that an appointment is done where we would pre-vet them. We would know if insurance is going to cover, we would let them know ahead of time, sign any forms they need. And then they would simply show up the way they do to a virtual appointment. And that's how we're going to go about it at first. Eventually we hope to have in-person classes as well. And that we haven't figured out what the best approach would be. Probably there would have to be a staff member who is checking everyone in, and then the dietitian would be in the room ready for the patients when they arrive. Excellent. It seems like it, it seems like a very exciting opportunity for patients itself, but it also seems like a very exciting opportunity, uh, especially at UCLA and a couple other places you mentioned for a large amount of research to um, provide. Uh, care to a larger group of people in, at one setting. So it seems like both are very exciting areas um, to explore. Um, and then this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what is a reasonable self-pay rate that meets industry standards? A great question. And it's going to depend on where you're located. So again, I'm in Los Angeles where the rates are probably higher than they are in other parts of the country. Um, so a lot of private practice dietitians are charging somewhere around $300 for an initial session or $325 for an initial session. That's at least standard in Los Angeles. I, I can't say what's standard in other parts of the country. Um, so UCLA's is actually below industry standard, and I'm working with them to actually raise that up a little bit. We don't want it to be so high that it's no longer doable. But think about, at least this is how I like to tell patients about it, is think about how much money you've sent on spent on supplements that haven't worked or um you know taking classes that haven't taught you the things you were looking for and instead you're going to spend that money knowing that you're going to get re good return on your investment all of a sudden that money seems very doable for these patients excellent excellent um i think it's wise a lot of people um spend a lot of money on different things at uh, the local pharmacy or grocery store um mm -hmm without having any guidance. Um, then uh, the, another one from Brooke Irwin is uh, another question. What do you do for patients, especially Medicare, who cannot afford visits but really need them? Yep, and so what we try and do is, um, so you can do up to 15 minutes 
without necessarily billing for it. And especially um, for dietitians, we can, at least at UCLA, what we've been mandated to do is we can do telephone sessions for follow-ups, but we cannot do a telephone session for an initial. Again, California can be very tough in terms of its rules. So I don't know if that's just a California mandate or a University of California mandate. So what we can do is if it's a new patient, what I'll often offer is say, well, what if I give them a 10 to 15 minute primer? I load them up with information as much as I can and then try and find them someone in the community who might be able to take care of them if we're not able to offer that services. Another thing we're hoping to offer at UCLA at some point is once a month um, that we have a full day where every dietitian schedule is open and basically based on socioeconomic needs or lack of insurance coverage, patients can fill in those slots and that way they are guaranteed that they're getting the care they deserve. Because I agree, it's not fair that these patients Patients don't get the care they need simply because insurance won't cover it or the pay is too much. Um, the other thing we're hoping to do is to have like a scholarship program where we can cover a certain amount of patients per year. So for instance, in our pancreatic, so we've got an amazing pancreatic dietitian, and she just brought in a grant that's going to cover for a lot of patient sessions so that if they can't afford it, she can still see these, these, pan these pancreatic um, cases. That's excellent advice. I think there's some, a lot of money, especially in the academic institutions, that people could uh, apply for different pots of money for that, especially in DEI situations and socioeconomic things. I think there's some money out there for that to Absolutely. compete for. Um, this is from Nicole Meisner again. Uh, does your institution have a policy for patients that cannot afford to pay the self-care rate but need an art, art registered dietitian? No. No. We don't, unfortunately. Okay. Well, I have one as our time is coming to an end here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, let me give you one more before I ask you my last qu a question before our time runs out. This is from Carol Erton Jones. I hope I said that correctly. Do, do you refer to local outpatient GI registered dietitians if you are booked too far out? Um, I think there's a great co collaboration opportunity. 100% yes. So we are very close with other LA based dietitians. And we actually gave our front desk staff a list of reputable dietitians in the community, so that if we're booked out too far, we're not just letting these patients fall through the crack, we're saying, well, why don't you go and see X, Y, or Z person over in Santa Monica, they can work with you this week. Perfect. And then if we don't get to any of the questions, the conversation will continue on Doc Matters. But we got about a minute and a half left. So, Nancy, I ask this all the time. So if you were giving some advice to someone who wants to continue to grow their division like you did yours, what would be a couple of pearls of wisdom you would give them to talk to their administrator or physicians or whoever they need to talk to inside their building to organically grow it? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is know your worth. So a lot of dietitians undervalue themselves. A lot of medical systems undervalue the dietitian. So knowing your worth, knowing that when you show up to these meetings to discuss the patient need and the doctor need for dietitian services, it's a real thing. Um, as you saw with my presentation, you can support it with facts. So we can easily prove the case that this is a needed service. So know your worth, know that we deserve to be part of that care team um, and, and do the work, show your value. I know for me, I, when I was first hired, I was told very, very clearly, if you're not good within three months, we'll fire you. And within three months, I was sitting in the chief's office and he said, you never have to worry about a job. They saw the value, right? So once we get in there and we do our work, they know why we need to be part of that care team. Excellent. And uh, the questions we didn't get to, we'll, we will send them to Nancy and we'll find, we'll get responses back to you. Thank you for everybody for tonight, for joining Nancy. Thank you very much for the blessed opportunity for you to speak with us. Thank you, Dr. Byrne, for chairing all this and Lori, uh, Enos, and Stephanie for a lot of work in the background. And um, we look forward to future ones and uh, good evening, everybody. I know. Thank you. Bye. Bye.